For nearly four decades now, October has been recognized as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We want to use this show to educate ourselves everything cancer. And who else but to be privileged to be joined by a celebrated oncologist and the executive director of the Uganda Cancer Institute, Dr. Jackson Oriem. Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for accepting to speak to us. Yeah, thank you very much, Rahim. Doctor, let's start from the cancer burden in our country. How big is it a problem in this country? Yes, I think uh, to talk about uh, burden, uh, there are three facts which you need to know. Uh, you need to know about uh, our new cases. You need to know about the present situation. And also you need to know about uh, the gravest uh, impact uh, it is having. So we call those, uh, for the uh, new cases, we call it incidents. And then for uh, the situation, what it is, we call it uh, prevalence. And then for the impact, we call it mortality. And actually that is about really the death uh, that uh, uh, cancer is uh, meeting on, on the population. Um, for Uganda, uh, the most recent statistics that we have, which is uh, fairly comprehensive, although it is also an extrapolation, uh, shows that uh, we have up to about um, 32,000 uh, new cases that is captured within a year. And then of that, uh, the uh, prevalence the estimate is that at any one time we have up to about 60,000 people uh, living uh, with, with, with cancer. And then uh, the gravest of all is the very high mortality, uh, which stands at about uh, 23,000. So if you look at that figure and you compare uh, the uh, incidence, which is the new cases, and then the mortality, that shows that um, for all the 32,000 new cases, uh, if 23,000 are dying, that means actually the mortality is standing about 79 to 80 uh, percent, which is very, very, very high. And that means that um, we need to look at the factors that in the first place uh, lead to um, the high uh, incidence and then also the factor that leads to the high mortality. And then of course, what is left out of that is the contribution to what the cases are at any one time, uh, which we call the, the prevalence. Yeah. So um, there is something that can be done at all these different uh, levels or need to be done at all these different levels. And I think this is what maybe um, uh, an engagement like what we are having can actually explain to the population. What is key is we need to uh, reduce the uh, incidence. We need also to improve on survival. That means reducing uh, the mortality. And then, of course, uh, we need to see what we can do for already existing cases that are there in the population. And all that can be handled through what we call a proper uh, cancer-dedicated health system uh, which we call it cancer control. Okay. Doctor, the numbers are quite scary. Um, but maybe I could take you a little bit back to educate us a little bit more on how does it, how is it caused? It is not like HIV where I know maybe I, I slept with someone who is infected and therefore I could run to do a quick test and maybe find out that I am positive. How is cancer caused and especially the common causes of cancer? That's a very good question. Um, by and large, um, uh, the causes, the direct causes of cancers are not known. But we talk about what we call the risk factors. These are factors that we have proven that they contribute towards the development of, 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 of cancers. And in as far as we are concerned, uh, it is important to know these risk factors so because something can be done about them. And we do know that in our situation, um, the majority of the cancers are actually uh, related to infections. And then some are related to what we call 
uh, risk fa uh, um, uh, lifestyle risk factors. And then others may be actually uh, genetically uh, driven. So if we can divide uh, uh, those factors into the three, um, we can ask ourselves of the infection-related cancers, which are the most common in as far as our situation is concerned. So you can divide that now into the different segments of our community. Um, we do know that, for instance, uh, a cancer like uh, cancer of the cervix, which is actually the most common cancer in our population, is caused by a virus. And then, of course, others like cancer of uh, uh, the liver is also related to a virus. Uh, and then, of course, uh, cancers like um, cancer of the skin, we call it Kaposi Shakoma, is also related to a virus. And then you go to other cancers like, for instance, cancer of the stomach is related to a bacteria, you know. And then uh, there are also many others uh, that actually are uh, associated also with infection. Like, for instance, there is a cancer very common in children, we call it Bacchus lymphoma, is also related to a virus. So you can see that, you know, in our case, uh, if we are to control uh, cancers, we must actually identify uh, those potential, I would say, association that we can actually do something control. A case in point, we do now know that there is a vaccine uh, for um, um, human uh, papilloma virus, which is the cause of cervical cancer. So that is why you hear us emphasizing so much that you know young girls uh, should get vaccinated. And of course, I can also explain a little bit why Please. we have chosen that group. Mm. It's just simply because uh, in the first place, um, when you get exposed to the risk factors, it takes a bit of time for eventually the cancer to develop. Actually, it could take up to between 20 to 30 years. So that means that if you are to vaccinate somebody at this time, you are trying actually to prevent maybe a cancer uh, up to about 10 or 20 years uh, uh, later. And that is why uh, for a case of um, um, uh, cervical cancer or in, uh, for the case of the vaccination for human, uh, against human papilloma virus, uh, we kind of uh, target the younger group. Of course, the question will come, why young girls, why not boys and all that kind of thing. I would say the main driver of this is usually economics and you want to go for uh, the, how the, the, the return that you are going to get, uh, which group should you target in the first instance. And I think because of that economic reason, we have chosen that, okay, let us go for the young girls. Yeah. Mm. Um, Doc, the growth of, of, of cancer cases in the country over the years has grown. Of course, it is a wave. Are there some of the reasons that could explain this wave? That, that, that's a very good point. Um, the first thing which we should know uh, is that actually the cases have gone up. What we cannot say definitely is that, you know, there's um, a particular uh, factor which we can say this is what is now driving the cases up. But in general terms, what we can say is happening is that um, in the first place, in the past, um, our population used to be just mere maybe in the 60s, it was just about 9 million. You know? Now we are 45 uh, million uh, in the country. So what that means is that the base population at risk for development of cancer has actually gone up tremendously. So even if without uh, a particular factor, just the mere fact that our population has increased, that means we are actually likely to see more people coming up with cancer. So that's number one. And then number two, um, uh, the fact that um, we have improved capacity uh, for uh, diagnosis where we do have laboratories that can now assign name to most conditions. That means actually that cases which in the past were not being diagnosed or were not being actually named, 
currently are bearing at least some, uh, I would say, designation. And cancer is one of them. And an example I can give, in the past, there used to be so many people who we would say the diagnosis is unknown. And in most cases, people are talking about, could this be maybe other things? Witchcraft, what, all that kind of thing. Uh, if you look in the population now, you'll find that less and less of those type of uh, assertions are being made. It's just simply because now we are good at making a diagnosis. So that's number two. And then number three, of course we cannot say that really some of the factors that we are talking about has not increased in our population. So there may be also that increase in those risk factors that I've mentioned. I give you an example. For instance, the number of people who are indulging in uh, lifestyles that are risky, like for instance, smoking, alcohol consumption, um, we cannot say for certainty that that has not actually increased. So if um, that is being now done in our population, because there are many ways, uh, for tobacco, for instance, now uh, there are people who are going for other ways of taking tobacco, uh, like shisha, what, all those things are contributing factors in which actually we can lump together as lifestyle factors that are also driving uh, cancer in our in, 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 in our population. So you can see that, you know, if you put all these uh, together, we should not be very surprised that the numbers have also gone up. Let me also mention one other factor that people may not actually be aware of, which we feel is also a good thing in a way. Um, our awareness about cancer was very low. About uh, 2000, for instance, uh, we were talking at about the awareness in the population was less than 3%. Those who you can go to and then ask, do you know about cancer? And they'll tell you that, yes, we know about cancer. And can I describe ex uh, to some extent to your satisfa satisfaction that what they're talking about is actually cancer. As I talk now, awareness has actually gone up tremendously. And we are now talking of about 8 to 10% awareness level in our population. What does that translate to? That translates to now people actually seeking, for instance, uh, screening for cancers. Uh, people are going to health facilities. People are questioning whatever. If there is anything which is complicated now that uh, happens to somebody in the population, the first thing that when they go to a health worker, they talk about, could this be cancer? So you can see that, you know, that in itself, that fact that awareness has increased is also driving people now to seek medical attention. And in most cases, or in some cases, if this is going to lead to a cancer diagnosis, that adds to the, to the statistic. Finally, we have also actually improved in as far as our capacity uh, to manage patients are concerned. And I think that in itself is a good thing because now uh, when people talk about cancer, they remember about Uganda Cancer Institute, they remember about uh, uh, treatment for cancer, and I think that is also now driving the numbers up. To me, that one uh, is, of course, cancer diagnosis is not a good thing, but if the diagnosis is being made in the hands of professionals, because now we have the capacity. I think that is a good thing because that means treatment is going to be effective. Well, obviously, um, it's, it's quite amazing what you just said, um, levels of managing it and the growth that we have had as a country. But let's speak a little bit more about the cancer treatment. I know that it is one of the most expensive uh, treatments. What do we handle as a country? What don't we have in terms of capacity to handle? And, and maybe speak a little bit more about chemo. Yeah, I think that, that, that's a good question. Um, actually, I think uh, uh, Ugandans should really be very, very proud of what their government is doing, the capacity that it has built in handling cancers. Because if you go around our uh, neighboring countries and you talk about cancer management, uh, cancer diagnosis, if at all is there, is real death uh, sentence. But when you come to, to Uganda, um, the 
the, 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 the picture is actually quite different. And, and, and I think we need to um, attribute this to the fact that there is a standalone set-up system for managing cancer uh, in the country under the Uganda Cancer Institute. And this has actually increased access even to complicated uh, treatment. You have just spoken about uh, chemotherapy. Actually, uh, it is very, very uh, unusual in most African countries to have uh, chemotherapy being given effectively and per protocol uh, to patients with, 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 uh, with, 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 with cancer. And uh, this complicated treatment being given at no cost. So our access now, uh, in as far as our patients are concerned for chemotherapy, is between 85 to 90 percent to what we call essential anti-cancers. And this has been just simply because of how uh, the Ministry of Health uh, has actually worked with the Uganda Cancer Institute to ensure that uh, there is drug availability. And as a result of that, actually, we have attracted quite a number of patients coming from neighboring countries to seek treatment here. Uh, if time permit, you had the time, you could just walk around our campus here you will be shocked the number of patients coming from outside the country. From as far as Eritrea, we get patients coming from Kenya, we get patients coming from Congo, patients coming from Sudan, all of them are here. And that constitutes up to about 15% of our patient population. So that means up about 85% uh, of people who are getting treatment here are actually Ugandans and 15% are But how who are expensive from is outside. this treatment? Well, it is quite expensive from the, because there is nothing for nothing. But as I told you earlier, our treatment is free and this budget is being uh, bankrolled by the government of Uganda. And not only that, of course, as you know very well, we have also now uh, increased our capacity for treatment with radiotherapy. Uh, previously, we were having only one machine. Now, as I speak, we have up to four machines, and three of those machines are IN equipment. We call them linear accelerator. And if you go to radiotherapy now, you'll find that actually uh, patients are being treated on time and per protocol and based on uh, what we call a multidisciplinary team that usually goes through the patient's information and they assign the patient the treatment according to what his or her disease state uh, warrants. And of course, we are also providing some of the most IN uh, treatment in as far as those areas are concerned. That actually, we are the envy of very many uh, on the African continent. Doctor, you said treatment is, is, is free of charge. It's free of charge. But there are reports that some people actually ask for money. Well, uh, that may be true. Of course, I should also clarify here that uh, we do also offer private cancer treatment service, which is paid for. And there, of course, uh, as you know, in every um, um, health facility, there is the private wing as well as uh, the general wing. But the majority of our patients are in the, the general wing where the uh, treatment is free. And then a few patients actually uh, do go for the private uh, service where they do pay. But what I should emphasize here is that uh, one good thing about cancer treatment is that the protocols that we use for treatment is the same. So even if you are uh, in the private side or you are in the general side uh, and uh, you are being treated for a particular cancer, the treatment is the same. There is virtually no difference. The private wing may be the only thing it may have a little bit of ambience here and there, and maybe you are being treated uh, a bit differently in the sense that uh, you are not queuing as the others are queuing and all that kind of thing. But basically, at the end of the day, after you are treated, uh, the outcome is going to be the same. Okay. Doc, I, I can imagine, um, like any other person, when you're told that you have cancer, the first thing that perhaps comes to your mind is, I'm going to die. You know, it's a death sentence for me. And 
you know, you meet these people every single day. What could you tell them in, if there's someone who's watching or someone as a member who has just been diagnosed with cancer? That, that, that's a very good, that is a very good question. In fact, uh, to me, and this is what actually drives me every day, um, cancer is just like any uh, disease in that we need to look at it optimistically because something can be done about it. The thing which makes uh, uh, management difficult and creates sentiments like uh, what you are just reflecting is the fact that this is a multi, I would call it uh, a multi-pronged problem that needs to be handled in a way that is well coordinated. Uh, because um, one factor can actually scuttle the entire plan that you have for a good, a good outcome. So what we see and what feeds uh, the sentiment of the hopelessness with which cancer is viewed is just simply because we haven't come to the point of organizing the management of the disease or the control of the disease in line with what actually should be done. That means, in the first place, we don't want people to get cancer. That means we need to prevent it. And that in itself starts much, much earlier by addressing the factor that I told you about at the beginning. So that is one. So now when you come to a point when it cannot uh, be prevented, what should be done next? Let us have early diagnosis or timely diagnosis. Is that what we are doing right now? And how can that be done? That means we need to set up a system which allows people to kind of get screened and also get diagnosed in a timely manner so that the next thing can be done. The next is what we call effective treatment. So effective treatment, you are treating people with a plan, a goal in mind. Yeah. The first goal should be, of course, has this patient come in a timely manner? Yes. So how am I going to treat? I'm going to treat with the intention to cure. So that must be upfront and you know the tools are there how to achieve that. And then of course, if maybe somebody has come late, you also have a plan for that. You know, you say, okay, this has reached maybe an advanced stage, but nonetheless, there's something which can still be, uh, be done. How can we treat this patient effectively where you modify that now to say, okay, can we prolong survival? Can we give a good quality of life? You also have the tools that can help you to actually achieve that. And then we come to a point when now, for instance, somebody has been out there, he didn't know about anything. In most cases, most of our people have been going to you see alternative medicine. They have done everything there. And then finally they come to you uh, those are the ones that actually now need to be handled from the perspective of how can we improve uh, their well-being, how can we um, make sure that they are supported, how can we make sure we control the development of the disease so that we can give them at least some time and free of symptoms, things like pain, you may be a problem of feeding and all that kind of can be. We have also the mechanism how we can do that. And it's very popular here in Uganda. You have heard of palliative care. That is the sole aim of why palliative care should be done. But also finally, there are those who can actually go through to having long survival and those we call them survivors. We need to see how we can also keep them healthy for as long as possible. And we have mechanism for doing that. Now, if you put all these together, the first thing which defines all of them is that they are complex, okay? And then the second thing is that they are actually costly, you know? So in order for us to have all that mechanism in place, you know, we need to invest a lot. And that is the reason why people do not understand uh, why the Uganda Cancer Institute is putting a lot of emphasis on things like 
Let us have treatment in place. Let us buy all those equipment. Let us have the infrastructure. Let us expand our, 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 our services. You know, all these call for resources. And partly because we have not invested in this for a very long time, we are actually coming from a very deep hole. And right now, even though you see that, you know, we are somewhere, we are still in the hole. The only thing that we are seeing out of the hole is sunshine. It is up there. So we still need to climb out. After we have had sufficient investment, after we have had well-coordinated system, that is when now we can begin to breathe some shy of relief. And that means that we have now reached the level where most of these other developing countries are in terms of what we call their cancer control. And the evidence there is going to be something like this. If you go outside, uh, for instance, uh, in Europe, in America, uh, some countries, the developed world, they will ask you about uh, the stat statistics uh, for cancer survival. Their statistics now stands at up to about 80 to 90 percent survival. So that means only about less than 10 percent of their patients with cancer are actually dying. Is it because they're special? No. It's just simply because they have set up a system like what I've just been describing over the years. They have been investing in this system and it is now well oiled and is actually running. So if you have all this in place, uh, Rahim, what I can tell you, this uh, uh, notion that cancer is a death sentence will disappear. And I think I've explained to you why I look at the picture from um, an optimistic point of view. Okay. Well, you, you, you mentioned about expanding services, and I know that we'll be speaking a little bit more shortly on that. Let's speak about uh, patient-doctor pressure. I know that the number of oncologists in the country are not that much, and indeed um, the number of those doctors that specify in that particular um, 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 treatment are not quite the number of patients that we have. How do you handle that? I think that's a good point. And how I can respond to it is, let us not only look at it from the perspective of a patient doctor. Mm? We should look at it from the perspective of our population versus um, our health workers that are focusing uh, on, 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 on cancer. Actually, that is still very, very low. And of course, if you are now talking about the patient uh, doctor uh, ratio, um, we have just a handful of specialists we call uh, oncologists. And that simply means that uh, we cannot even just talk about the comparison. If the figures that I gave you at the beginning, uh, you divide it by the number of oncologists. Right now at the Uganda Cancer Institute, we have instituted some training programs and the numbers of our oncologists has actually gone up. Uh, we can now boast of between uh, 30 to of 40 uh, oncologists here at the Uganda Cancer Institute. And if you compare that to about um, uh, 1990s, and early 2000, when I actually started practice, <laughs> there was just two or so people like that in the country. So to me, this is a very big advancement that we, 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 we have reached. But the point I'm trying to drive is that we should look at it from an holistic perspective because it takes uh, community health workers, it takes uh, nurses, uh, it takes uh, doctors, it takes the specialists, it takes everybody in order for us to deliver an effective uh, cancer uh, service in the country. So we should look at it from that perspective, not necessarily just looking at the specialists or the oncologists. And so that is how I, 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 let, I look at it. And I think uh, the way, the direction we are taking, uh, if we are given the support that is needed, as you know now we have training programs, we need to expand those training programs to all those cadres that I'm talking about. From the oncologists, we need to move to the nurses, we need to move to the abortion people, so that I develop or we develop that team, that well-coordinated team that I described for you. And it is that team that will help us now to kind of come up uh, with a service that is going to have a dent on the burden, which is actually the first question that you asked me. 
I know that a few years ago, uh, the moment you walked in here, the numbers of people outside waiting for treatment, waiting to stay here because perhaps they had um, appointments that lasted for a week and therefore having to travel back home and then coming back would be not only an economical uh, burden, but also a burden um, to them. You, you would miss your appointment. Um, quite frankly, the numbers have reduced. How have you handled that situation? That, that's a very good question, a very good one, from the sense that I, can con I might contradict you yeah. and tell you that actually the numbers have not reduced, the numbers have increased. But what has happened is that the Institute has come up with a very innovative way of organizing its service. And uh, we have introduced a certain other delivery mechanism that in the past actually was not available. Um, one of the things which uh, we discovered uh, was causing the crowding and everything is just simply because we do not have a way of coordinating how our care uh, is given. So what we introduce is what we call a patient navigation, which is a simple thing. We ask ourselves that why is it that when you come to the institute, you'll find that you know some patients are sitting under a tree, other, others are maybe talking, they don't know. They, they, there seems to be just um, a level of uh, not knowing what next to do. We realize that most of our people are coming from upcountry. And this is their first time to be here in Kampala. And when they come to this, uh, you know, very expansive uh, facility, uh, they are overwhelmed. Hmm. So for that matter, we need to hold their hands hmm? and then try to move them to the different desks, to the different points, uh, so that, you know, in as quickly as possible a manner, they get what actually brought them uh, here. So we created that navigation program and we improve the way patients are registered and the way they are coordinated with their care points and all that. That was actually a master stroke. Before long, we realized that actually all that you are talking about, the crowding and everything, has uh, disappeared. And people now have a direction where they should go. And if they have a problem, it's just a matter of asking. We have what we call those, the navigators, that are dotted all over the place. We improved signages, you know. For those who can read, you know, they can know where to go, you know. So that actually performed what I would call a miracle. But that also came with another question, uh, which was about, you know, well, now I can move around, I can find the doctors, but my treatment requires a longer stay in a Kampala. What do I do? So issues of accommodation. Yeah. So we came up with what we call a care home. And now those patients who do not have any relatives here in Kampala, they're coming here for the first time, but they're coming here as outpatients. They're not coming here to be admitted, but yet their being here is very important because they need to see their doctors to be reviewed or to be given treatment for maybe a few days as outpatients. So the care home is now taking care of those type of, of patients. And it is a home away from home. And that has actually improved our, uh, what I would call um, compliance with our treatment. Because some patients, they even come a week before their appointment because they, want, they don't want to miss the appointment with their doctors or their treatment. And for that matter, actually, uh, the effectiveness of the treatment that we are giving them has also benefited from that, I would call it a reorganization of how we do things here uh, at, 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 at the Institute. Maybe that explains my observation because then they are take care home uh -huh. uh, as opposed to you know, seeing them with their bedding exactly. you know, corridors exactly. of the hospital. Exactly. What does the future look like? The future is very bright in as far as uh, cancer management in the country is concerned, I would say as far as cancer control uh, is concerned. Um, as I speak now, uh, we have actually come up 
with a very comprehensive uh, uh, national cancer control uh, program, which is the document that is going to help us in coordinating the way we do things, the roadmap, how we should do things in as far as cancer is concerned in the country. And this cancer control document has everything, all the steps we need to take and the cost associated with this. And this runs for about five years. We will evaluate it later. It's going to be a starting point uh, for uh, what I was telling you. And within that, issues like infrastructure development, issues like um, decentralization of service. Of course, I've just told you, it is good that now we are having some order here and patients who are coming from up country have where to go. They don't need to fear. They don't need even to delay. But there is also the issue of, for instance, transport. How do they come from there up to here? We need to solve that. But how, can, how better can we solve than, that than by having services nearer to them? So uh, we are developing what we call regional cancer centers, um, where we are going to start off with at least four within the current National Development Plan. That is National Development Plan 3. We are going to have one in Bale, one in Barara, one in Gulu, and then one uh, in Arua uh, for, for a start. And I have to inform you that uh, so far we have already delivered the one of Gulu. It's actually ready uh, for commissioning. We have already also to some extent started uh, the one in Bale, and we already also have some functionality uh, in the one for um, Barara and the one uh, in, in Arua. I call it functionality because uh, the university in Barara gave us some space together with the regional referral hospital where we can in the meantime see our patients who are coming from western uh, part uh, of the country. And the same is also happening uh, uh, in Arua. So now imagine with that if in the next uh, let me say three, four years we have all these regional cancer centers working, and that means that patients can actually have there as the first call, you know, and they are simply brought here to Kampala when they have complicated conditions or whatever management cannot be done at uh, the regional level. So you can imagine that that is going to improve access tremendously. That means that even at a lower level, diagnosis can be made confidently because you know that after you have made that diagnosis, the patient can confidently walk to the uh, regional cancer center and then get the attention. Once you have hooked into the regional cancer center, it's as good as you are here at the Uganda Cancer Institute because we have a system or a conduit through which information, through which care plans and all that kind of thing is going to be done. And this is going to be done actually electronically, including things like how investigations are done, how that information is transmitted. We'll have a consultant or a senior consultant seated here, but in touch with the doctors at the lower level, you know. So that means all this is going to really improve. But at the final end, what we want to see is that the numbers of cancer cases are reduced. We want to see that our uh, treatment outcome is improved, the survival for our patients must go up, and then, of course, the issue of access must improve. And if we have all this in place, you can see for yourself why I'm very optimistic about the direction that things are taking. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Welcome. Dr. Oriem is optimistic, and so should we. We have been speaking to Dr. Oriem Jackson, who is the, uh, the executive director of the Uganda Cancer Institute and a celebrated oncologist. My name is Rahim Nwali, and this is The Hard Questions.